Hill, our CFO, Wesley Metz, and uh, our administrative assistant, Hannah Pruitt from operations. So with that, before we get started, I just wanted to make one acknowledgement. Uh, Mr. Smith, are you there? I believe this is your last, yes, fin is this your last finance committee meeting? Uh, I think so, I'm not <laughs> sure, who knows? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I just yes. want to make sure that we acknowledge that and just uh, be sure to say thank you for your service. And we will have an exceptionally long meeting. So those minutes that you read at the board meeting will be nice and long. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. You know, that, no, I, I really enjoy and appreciate the three years that I've been able to, uh, number one, serve on the board and, and the three years that I've been able to be on this committee. Learned a lot. I hope I contributed some things to it. So yes. All right. Hey, everything. Appreciate everybody. Even appreciate old old Mr. Murdoch, who you know we used to have these meetings at ten in the morning, but now <laughs> we have them at uh, seven thirty in the morning. So, uh, but that's good. That's good. That's good. So anyway, I, I thank you, to... thank you for everything, everybody. You, you, well, uh, there's no better team around than uh, the Lee Summit R seven staff and and the central office people. So. Thanks, Dennis. All right, we are going to jump into the agenda today. Um, Dr. Del Sem and Dr. Carlson, do you want to talk us through Qualtrics, please? Yes, I'm happy to begin with uh, that first item. Qualtrics is a product that R7 used last year uh, through the Team Lee Summit uh, Employee Engagement Survey. Qualtrics uh, partnered with us in that they offered us a pilot year for that engagement survey. So we had a lower cost point for that in order to proceed um, with that product. Of course, uh, there's an increased cost for that. However, with that increased cost, last year we only had the opportunity to use their engagement platform, which was one survey opportunity. With um, increasing the cost, we have a wide span of survey options. So we can continue with the engagement survey, which is a dashboard of our last year's Team Lee Summit survey. And then further, that'll be this year's Team Lee Summit survey for comparative data. And then we can expand that to students, more teachers, um, and the community as well for surveying purposes. There's a lot of positive feedback from Team Lee Summit on its use and its application and the data that it provided to the team. Um, and so we see that that can be expanded to a number of departments as we try to con continue to expand our community engagement. Um, we think there's a lot of value to that. Um, on a side note, just so you know, we do have another survey tool in the district that we plan to selectively abandon um, in order to expand Qualtrics. Um, and so uh, we, we plan to do that later this summer with that company. Questions you might have on Qualtrics? No? Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Delsum and Dr. Carlson. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, knowledge works. Uh, um, so we are going to go to, I believe it's uh, Dr. Andrews. Oops, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Caring School Community Pilot Program, my mistakes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope you can hear me because sometimes I have bandwidth problems here, so, okay. Looks like I'm good, I see head nods. Um, the Scaring, Caring School community is the SEL um, curriculum that is embedded within the collaborative school classroom. And we are piloting seven elementary schools for the 2021 school year. And the um, cost is in reference to all of the resources. So one kit for each teacher in each of the grade levels at the seven schools, plus one administrator kit uh, for each school. So um, looking forward to having this as a possibility, especially now coming uh, off uh, closure from COVID-19. Um, you know, well-being and social emotional learning is uh, um, of probably even higher priority in some places um, than we've looked at before. 
So I'll take any questions you might have. I do have one question on this one, Dr. Hill. What is the possibility or did we, have we asked about even expanding to a few more elementary schools because of coming out of closure? And is there any, would there be any benefit to trying to pilot even half or two thirds or whatever when we know what's coming here with students coming back in the fall? Sure. Uh, I, I would love to do that if possible. Um, but I also know that many of our elementaries um, are fo focused on some of the other initiatives ac across the district, meaning Greg Tang um, and, and math, and also the um, career to work. There are some of our elementary schools that are trying to focus more on the um, Kaufman grant and the um, career to work uh, um, programs that we've been uh, doing virtual calls with. And, you know, as you know, um, world of work is also being life ready, which is also social emotional learning too. So um, I feel like some of the components will be developed through that as well. So I would always like to expand, um, but um, I also don't want to do over initiative fatigue. Yeah, it's helpful else, to have a few schools that are out in front and that can help lead the way for the subsequent schools, but we, we understand your concern with the closure. And I would also add, you know, our school counselors at um, all of our levels have um, lessons and, um, you know, naturally just jump into classrooms as needed. So I feel like the social emotional supports are in place. Um, you know, can we always improve? Sure. Um, but I, this does give us some good feedback from the seven schools on whether or not we want to continue with um, caring school community. I, sorry, I keep jumping in because I keep forgetting things. My apologies. Um, our work with Panorama, they are giving us access for all teachers to what they call their playbook. Their playbook has many of um, like Character Strong, Second Step, um, Inspired Ed, SEL lessons embedded within them. Um, and so every teacher will have access to that SEL resource next year. Any other questions? Good, okay. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Appreciate you being here this morning. All right, now I'm back on track. Dr. Andrews, uh, Knowledge Works. Yes, thank you. Um, Knowledge Works is a professional development and consulting contract that Summit Technology Academy, Summit Ridge Academy um, are putting forward. They did some work with um, the Knowledge Works um, group this year on self evaluation and analysis, and would like to move forward over the next couple of years working with them. The work that Knowledge Works does is specifically around personalized learning and kind of self agency for students, helping students develop um, that being an agent for themselves, so to speak, and working through. So, Summit Technology Academy has worked closely with their staff on trying to grow um, that ownership of learning with students um, as they work in. You know, whether it be internships or working towards certifications. So aligns very well um, with our Kaufman work. Um, we've actually written this in as one of the potential things um, on the Kaufman grant, but also believe that it is very valuable and Summit Technology Academy and Summit Ridge, as well as our professional development office have um, allocated funding so that we can move forward with that, even if it um, would not be included in the Kaufman grant. So they're very excited about the work and um, hoping to continue um, that process at Summit Tech and Summit Ridge. So happy to answer any questions. Okay, not, okay. not seeing any. Um, Here now, it looks like I'm up again um, with cinematic visions and virtual graduations. Have been working closely with our high school principals over the last several weeks as we've had to unfortunately 
move our graduations away from our traditional May. We do have an in-person graduation date set for July 25th, and this um, says nothing about us continuing with that date and working towards a hopeful opportunity to have a more traditional graduation ceremony um, for our students. That said, um, we're realists at the same time and do understand that we may not um, have that opportunity to gather in the large groups. Our graduations are four to 5,000 people in a traditional um, setting. So we wanted to be properly prepared and have a professionally done quality virtual graduation ceremony that we could stream and provide copies to our students in the case that um, we would have to make adjustments to our virtual one. The other portion was we did not want to wait till mid-June to, you know, or even July to make a decision about that in person and then be way behind the game on trying to provide a quality um, program for our students. So we had several reach outs um, from individuals, talked to a couple of them. Um, high schools actually also had a presentation from um, Justin's group a little bit on that, but um, landed on Cinematic Visions, um, a company that we already work with that stream our um, board meetings, et cetera. And after meeting with them, felt they provided us the best opportunity to truly have a professionally done quality program with that. So um, we hope to get started on that production right away. Um, we would film all of the graduation student speakers, as well as the principals, superintendent, et cetera, and collect photos with um, caps and gowns. Now that those are being passed out from parents, et cetera, work with our buildings on that, and then basically produce in parts um, a full ceremony that then we could announce and stream for students, then also make available to them the um, the program. So if it goes through, we are able to have the graduation, we would still provide this to them, an additional memento um, to remember during a, you know, a troubled time is never a bad thing. So um, we're hoping to go ahead and get started and move forward with having this um, as our backup. So happy to answer some questions. Okay. Thank you, I Dr. Just, I, I just I appreciate the the work on this and the and the, the thought it must have gone into this to, uh, to to figure out some other way. Or regulars, we're going to know it this year. Will the students still? Or will we still do this virtual? Will each student still get this virtual package? This program? Yes. Yes, we would, we would end up providing what we create to all students, um, regardless of whether we have um, the in-person or not. Um, we're going to have it ready. Um, you know, if we ended up having to make an adjustment to the in-person, we would do it um, as soon as we can to keep, you know, as much um, opportunity as we could with it in a timely manner. If we have the in-person, we, we, we would just provide this to them then as an additional item we wouldn't want to show it beforehand that, that, that that's really cool appreciate what you guys have been figuring out on that so thank you thank you thanks dr andrews um now we're going to turn it over to uh sarah mcmillan with business services Sarah, are you muted by chance? Yes, you would think I would have this down by now. I apologize. I can make the um, cut real, right? So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to quickly review the district's employee assistance program and then uh, go through the RFP process that we completed earlier this year. 
so first, just to give you a little bit of a background and to make you aware of the program that we currently have through Empathia. We have been with Empathia since the last RFP, which was completed in 2017. And our current contract uh, with Empathia does expire at the end of June. So EAP is a benefit that is 100% paid for by the district, and it is available to all benefit eligible employees, their spouses, and dependent children, as well as uh, to those employees who leave the district and continue their coverage under the district's retiree or COBRA plans. Um, the program is a six session counseling model um, it also includes work-life resources, as well as financial and legal consultation. We have 60 on-site training hours per year, which we really do utilize through the district's employee well-being program. Um, Empathia's website contains many resources, uh, which include a live chat feature, video counseling, legal forms, and um, a whole lot of uh, well-being materials as well. So something we are very proud of, uh, the district's current utilization is 11.6%. Um, and when you compare that to the national average of 3 to 6%, we are just doing awesome in that area. Um, and prior uh, to being with Empathia, our utilization was only 4%. So earlier this year, um, it seems like it was a long time ago, but it was really January and February, um, as required every three years, we did go out to bid for a July 1st implementation. Uh, we had an RFP team that is making uh, this recommendation to the board. Uh, the team included my benefits and well-being team, uh, Dr. Carlson, Andy Campbell, Dr. Hill, Heather Falls, and Wes Metz. Uh, CBIS sent the proposal out to the vendors listed here on your screen. Uh, there were a couple of vendors that did not respond on time. So per district policy, their proposals were not reviewed. Uh, so the vendors that did respond on time and reviewed by the team were Empathia, LifeWorks Strategies, and IBH Solutions. So the team came together and we reviewed a comprehensive spreadsheet on what the differences were between the three providers and that document is included uh, with the board agenda. Uh, so this team is recommending to the board to continue our EAP services with Empathia. Uh, we did take into account the service that has been provided by Empathia the last three years. Um, and then the possible disruption of moving to another provider. Um, and the service we have received from Empathia um, really has been excellent. Uh, so one area that Empathia really uh, stands above the other vendors is their call center. Uh, their call center, um, it's a live answer and they answer 24 hours a day 365 days a year, um, and they are staffed with master level counselors. Uh, so with this comprehensive intake process uh, with a qualified counselor, it really does ensure an employee or their family member receives immediate crisis intervention, um, an assessment of their needs, and then a referral to a counselor um, specializing in that area of need, which it's very important. It takes a lot of courage uh, for some employees or their staff members just to call Empathia. Um, so having that live person answer so quickly um, ensures that that employee is going to receive the help um, that they need. So Empathia really did uh, stand out in many other areas, which I'm not going to go through. They're there on your screen and then also in the board agenda item. RFP did result in a price increase from $1.31 per employee per employee per month to $2.40 per employee per month. And this is due to our high utilization. So it is common for an EAP provider when they present their pricing, they do base it on the estimated three to six percent utilization, uh, which I talked about earlier, the district has far exceeded, which is really excellent. So the contract includes a guaranteed three year rate. Uh, we will continue with the six counseling session model. And then uh, to help uh, ease that increase of costs, we've reduced our on-site hours uh, to 40. 
So employees will continue to have access to the work life and website resources. Uh, really the high utilization to me indicates employees have built trust in the program um, and it would be disruptive for employees and their family members uh, to make a change. So that really was a key factor uh, that our team uh, focused on. So the current annual cost is 40,872 based upon an employee count of 2,600. So the new annual cost will be 78,912 based on an eligible employee count of 2,740. So we ha have had an increase in staff over the last three years. So um, that employee population had to be adjusted for that. So that is an annual increase of about $38,000, uh, which will be included in next year's employee benefits budget. So uh, contract was reviewed by legal and it is a three-year term with an auto renew after the initial term. So before I open it up for questions, I know Dr. Hill um, is on the call and so is Dr. Carlson. So Dr. Hill, is there anything you would like to add? You bet. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, there are a couple of things I wouldn't mind adding. Um, when we first uh, started using Empathia, unfortunately, we had several um, uh, student deaths and uh, situations to support our staff and students. And so it was um, so great to have Empathia um, assist with finding um, well-respected and calm um, therapists to help in that difficult time. Uh, the other thing I would add is um, I've been on several webinars during the closure um, with many districts across the nation and um, talking about what can we do for staff as we return and so forth. And over and over, I heard many school districts do not have an EAP system. So I just want to reiterate how important and lucky we are uh, to have EAP uh, because without it, um, you know, we would be potentially stressing um, the system even more um, by trying to find different uh, community resources. So thanks, Sarah. Well, job well done on the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Carlson. Anything you would like to add? No, Empathia has served us well and the increased utilization is evidence of that. Any questions for Sarah? or Dr. Hill or Dr. Carlson. Yeah, Dr. Miller, I do have a question on this one. Um, because this kind of rolls into obviously a health insurance and benefits kind of thing. Um, and I think that it's awesome that uh, we're doing 100% coverage here of Empathia. My question is, is that if the increase in the budget is going to come out of our benefits budget here coming up in the next year, is there a way to ensure or how are we going to communicate that that increased cost of Empathia is not going to be passed on to employees through their benefits um, contribution that they're going to have to be making through their health insurance? Right, okay, good question. Mr. Metz, are you on the phone? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, did you wanna to respond to that? Well, the yeah. cost isn't passed on to, to the employees because it's a district paid expense. So, so what, I, what I, I guess what I'm getting at here is because CBiz is a part of this bidding process and CBiz is also a part of um, our health insurance bidding process, how do we ensure that even a fraction of that money that CBiz is charging us and or through the negotiation of our health insurance plan isn't getting passed on to our staff to help cover some of the costs of the increase in Empathia. There, 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 there isn't any pass on to the staff because it's a district paid expense. So, I mean, it just hits our budget. It's not like health insurance where they have to pay a portion of it. And with CBiz, with, since this is an or ancillary program, the commission's paid through the, the company, not from us. Okay, okay. That, there that, is that, a commission. That is, yeah. that is the, that's the answer that I, that I was hoping for. Okay. Okay. There we and, go. And, and, and actually, um, Ryan, there is not a commission uh, that's paid on EAP. Uh, so CBIS okay. doesn't okay. receive, 
any sort of commission um, on EAP services. Okay. And I really appreciate that because as you know, when we went through the health insurance, we know that we're looking at the commission portion of theirs as well. So I just wanted to make sure that those two things were separate. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And we'll be sure to continue to communicate um, to staff that this is a benefit that uh, will continue to be 100% paid by the district. Um, so in our communications to staff, uh, we'll just ensure that that happens. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, and I think we, at this point, we are on to uh, meal prices, nutrition services, and Lori Donella. Good morning. Um, basically, this is a carryover from last year. Um, using our um, paid equity tool, we should have raised prices last year by 21 cents. We've been behind the last few years because there were times that we didn't raise prices that we probably should have. Um, the 20 cents will bring us up to um, $2.50 for elementary, and then for middle and high school, we'll go up to $2.70. Um, most of the area districts are around the 270 to 280 mark, so we will probably have to increase again next year, and we should be on target by then. Um, so this is the recommendation that we're asking is to approve the 10 cent increase in um, the breakfast meals. Any questions? Doesn't look like it. Laura, I appreciate you uh, including that district comparison um, with your board submittal. I think that's very helpful. Okay. You doing that. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, with that, we're going to turn it over to a number of facility updates uh, to Kyle, starting with the facility use fee schedule. Hey, thank you very much. Um, the facility use team, um, the process action team met on May 6th, and we uh, went through the annual process of reviewing process and procedure for facility use uh, according to board policy KG, um, and also reviewed the facility schedules themselves. Um, this year, you'll notice a little bit of a change um, in that we've, um, we've rolled in the other two fee schedules that are in the district for uh, Missouri Innovation Campus and the Aquatic Center. <clears throat> and so we expanded our team and reviewed those as a part of our normal process. Um, so at this time, um, the, the team did not recommend any increases and there are no um, changes to discuss. So I'll just open that up for questions if there are any. Not seeing any. Okay. I will go on to the next item, uh, Woodland Sewer Project Change Order Number One. Um, so when we bid the project, our original plan was to connect to um, an Evergy power pole um, that's on the south side of the property. And um, typically what will happen when you need utility is that um, Evergy would evaluate the, the consumption of uh, the utility and if you have a significant use, then they would provide the transformer and, and support some of that project cost. Um, of course, this is just running a, a pump station. There's really not much use. And so we would have been um, paying for um, running the, the utility to Evergy's pole and um, connecting to the transformer. And so um, that was a planned project expense that we had that would have been paid to Evergy. Um, after evaluating that, we um, looked at other options because if we connect with Evergy, we have to pay a meter fee every month forever. Um, so that does add costs to the district long term out of our operating budget. And so um, we changed courses and ran the utility to our existing service for Woodland Elementary School so it can be fed off the same meter um, as the elementary school. Um, the cost was about the same, um, so we felt like that was a, uh, a good long-term decision for the district. Um, the other item on this change order is related to the monitoring and control of the pump station. Um, originally, we were anticipating having a network connection that would control it through the computer side of the world, um, and we switched and decided to 
um, run it through our built HVAC building automation system, which just runs a control wire out to the pump. And um, that will give us some additional ability to monitor the system real time um, and also for our guys to receive uh, alarms in case the, the system was ever in failure. So are there any questions about that item? Okay, these next two items, just kind of a quick summary of these next two items. We have a fire alarm and an intercom bed. Um, for recommendation. And both of these items are, are allocated in our district long-term capital budget. Um, they're in our long-term plan and we anticipate um, in the foreseeable future, at least the 10, next 10 to 15 years, replacing an intercom and a fire alarm every year in the district. And we have a lot of aged systems. And so um, this is a round of those scheduled replacements. So this first item is for replacing the fire alarm system at Pleasantly Elementary School. Um, I know it's kind of hard to believe, but it's actually the original fire alarm system in that building, um, 1965. And so um, really a testament to the level of service that our guys, our electricians provide and um, keeping systems running and, and operational. Um, so this was a, an advertised bid according to um, uh, our typical construction bidding requirements and um, our apparent low bidder was, uh, um, oh gosh, was Proelectric on this contract. So we are recommending award of that contract. Um, I'll just open it up, see if there's any questions. Okay, and so I, I don't want there to be any confusion when you look at the bid tabulations. We did bid both of these projects at the same time. And so both bids are on the same bid tabulation. Um, and that gave us the opportunity um, in case one contractor was low on both, um, then we could award them together. But um, we had different contractors as the low bid. So in the best interest of the district, we're awarding to um, different contractors. So. The next item is at Richardson Elementary, um, replacing the intercom system. Um, and again, that intercom system is original to the building from 1995. And um, we are uh, recommending award of this contract to Heartland Electric. So it's really not much else to the project other than just a, a nice clean intercom replacement. So I'll just open up, see if there's any questions. <laughs> Hey, um, Kyle, can you just refresh my memory on the uh, estimated completion date? Yeah, these projects will start here just in the next couple of weeks um, if approved, and um, they will run through the middle of July. Um, we always give contractors, you know, kind of the first of August is our, our drop dead date, but um, try to give us a couple of weeks of, um, of advance since the principals come back kind of the mid July range. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next item um, is a purchase that's over $25,000. So by board policy, we need to uh, bring it to the board for approval. Um, and that is for a, uh, a large area mower for our grounds department. Um, this is actually the really the workhorse of the, the district when it comes to mowing. We have two of these units. Um, as you see on the item, the, the one that we're that we're using right now is from 2007 and um, you know these mowers run all day every day for probably seven to eight months a year so um, it's a 12 foot um, toro we call it a bat wing mower it's the ones with the wings that that fold down and um, the mowers that we have that have served us really well um, is are the same toro units um, and so we'd like to recommend this for award to replace uh, one of our mowers. Are there any questions? Okay, on the facilities and maintenance project update, um, we're just getting ready to plan for summer. Um, we have a number of other planned capital projects and um, flooring, painting, just the, the routine maintenance type projects that are going on. Um, and uh, 
But these individual projects that are listed, um, we've talked about those in previous months. Um, the Westview roof will begin um, here around the 1st of June. They're gonna start um, tearing off the existing roof. Um, the district-wide roofing improvements have been going on for the last uh, week or two, um, which is great. They're getting a lot of repairs made and have started on a few of our buildings. Um, at least Summit West um, retaining wall system um, started construction last week and um, we've already got blocks shown up on site and uh, so they anticipate having that done before um, activities would be planned to start um, coming back for school. And then with bond planning, um, our teams are still working through the designs as planned um, in anticipation of a, uh, a hopeful uh, bond election. And uh, we're just excited for all of the, um, the improvements to the learning environments for kids. So I'll just open it up for any questions and conclude my presentation. All right, thank you, Kyle. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to Wesley Metz for the finance portion of our meeting. Wes, I think you're mute. I'm muted, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, the first item is the transfer for the teacher fund. That's the normal transfer, typical. It's $3.2 million for April. Uh, go to the treasurer's report, open up the financial. I had several questions on this report this month. So one of the questions was, I think they misunderstood what, what the report is showing. The first line, the estimated budget on revenues is $246 million. The second line is actual year to date. So through the end of April, we collected 215. When they were looking at it, it looked like that they were making the assumption that we were 30 million short for the year. Well, we're not. That's the, the first line's the year amount. So we still have two more year, two more months of revenue to collect to get to the 246. Last year in comparison, we collected about $32 million. So if we stayed kind of on that pace, we we should exceed or at least hit the 246 million in revenue. Um, I don't. I don't anticipate any shortfalls. I, I think we will hit that number. Maybe even exceed it a little bit. Um, it depends on when the COVID money comes. The state should be, um, or excuse me, it's called the CARES Act money. Um, should be sending out 75 percent of that money here fairly shortly. I'm thinking we'll probably get it in the June payment. Uh, which we're going to get about $1.3 million estimated from the CARES Act. Uh, it's based off of your Title I allocation, and it's about 82% of that number. So that's where the 1.3 comes from. Um, so that money will we'll, we'll receive it this year, but we'll probably end up spending most of it next year and allocating the money out of next year's budget. Um, expenditures are running a little less than what they were last year, um, even though the percentage looks a little higher because, uh, <clears throat> you know, with food service down and bass down and transportation down. So a lot of those expenses that you would normally have for like fuel for transportation, your food costs, purchasing food and stuff like that for food service and the supplies that bass would use to maintain their programs with those being closed um, we should see a slight reduction in expenditures for the total for the year. So year to date, I'm not too concerned about expenses more so on revenues, but I still think we're going to hit the budgeted amount for revenues. Uh, but with the short, we're also going to have a huge shortfall on the food service. If you look at the fund balances as on down here at the bottom in the right hand corner for restricted funds you can see that nutrition is falling really fast. So it's down to 800, 827,000. That will probably be completely wiped out by the end of the fiscal year. So I'm anticipating that being zero or even negative by the end of the year. And the same thing with the before and after school bass program. It's already at 185,000. I'm, I'm anticipating that it also will be wiped out. 
So the board will have to make a decision on whether we are going to uh, absorb those costs through district funds or if we're gonna leave the negative balance in there and expect them to try to recoup that money over a period of time. Um, any questions? Yeah, Wes, just one quick one, just on what you just said there. Um, how long would we have to be trying to make a decision? Meaning how long would we be giving those programs to try to make up those balances if that is the direction we took? You don't have to set a time frame for it. Okay. Um, some districts uh, keep negative balances in there. Uh, like I was, uh, I've explained this to Emily before. Most of the, the two districts I worked at before, our food service was always in the red. So our board there make a, made a standard um, motion every year to zero it out. So we would just transfer money from the operating fund <clears throat> into nutrition service to make it zero because we just always operated in the red. So I don't, you know, it could take them, if, if we want to leave the balance on there just to see where it is, that's fine. But, but everybody needs to understand that we are covering the, the negative balance through the general fund. Right. Right. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Wes. Yes, this, and this is, and this is, I don't mean to hit you cold with this, I'm, and I'm, and maybe I'm missing some right. Just out of curiosity, with everything that went on last year with the county property ta or the taxes, what was our did our percentages of our yearly percentages change a whole lot, or did did we receive our typical 97, 98 percent of the taxes on time? Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah, our delinquent taxes isn't that much. We have about $4 million. <clears throat> it's a little less than $4 million in protested taxes right now. What that means is we're not going to lose $4 million. We'll get a portion of that, but but it may be less. You know, I don't know how much. It could be a half of that amount, but we will receive part of that money just at a later date. We can request, I can send a letter, have our legal send a letter and have them release the funds to us. But then when it's under protest, if, if their taxes are reduced, then we have to pay it back. Yeah, right. So if no, you get the money now, then you ended up with a negative next year because you have to pay it back. So I, no, I, I was, I was just curious because I, and again, probably somewhere in all this, it, it, it shows I was just, I know at least some at school district tends to, what don't we tend to usually get 97, 98% of our, on a typical year. Yeah, we're, we're pretty close to that number. It may be closer to 96% this year because we have, like I said, 4 million in protested taxes. Every year you have a little bit of protested taxes, right. oh, okay. uh, but but this year it's just a little higher than normal. Okay. I just hadn't heard much about that from anybody, even, I mean, in the news or anything lately on, on where, where all that was going or what was going on. So I was just curious. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We're going to move on to the investment report, please. You can see our investments are running pretty close to where they were last year. Um, the reason that it's a little lower than what it was last year is because uh, I have more cash in our bank. With us being gone, I didn't want to take any chances that uh, we would get overdrawn at the bank. Not that they don't ever charge us any fees or anything because they know we have the money at another bank. But uh, so that's why it's a little less. It's not that we don't, we've lost any money or anything. And it's only about $3 million less. Now, interest right now is getting really low. <laughs> um, when stuff is coming due, we're reinvesting in it, and it's get, we're getting like 0.3% uh, interest. So, um, so we're doing a lot of short-term uh, treasury bills, which isn't really helping us too much. So we, we, we'll see a, a significant decline next year in our interest collections, I believe. Um, because a lot of our stuff is getting called. A lot of the stuff with Payne Weber, everything except the CDs, all those callables, those things can get called at any time. And when they call them, they pay off the interest at that time and then they reinvest at a much lower rate. Any questions? Okay. 
and we don't need to see the balance sheet. The balance sheet's a, just a restatement of the revenues and expenses. Unless you guys want to go through it. I mean, there's it's just a, the same numbers are on the, the revenues and expenses report. Looks good to me. I think that's it for our agenda. I, how, any other just general questions or uh, um, things that you'd like to address that maybe we didn't address earlier? Uh, Emily, and I don't know if Kyle's still on or not, but um, I'm just curious if, if with the graduations and now on the football fields and, and redoing those football, where are we? How's that being coordinated? Are, are the athletic fields in the process and I haven't been up around them anywhere. Are they in the process of being redone now? Or will they be done by the 25th? We put several hundred people on a new field. Does that have an effect? I, I just curious. No one's asked me. I was just, that's my own curiosity. Yes, we, um, we planned for that um, when we started the project, um, had a pre-construction meeting with our um, uh, construction group and they provided us a schedule showing uh, that they could be complete by the middle of July, um, which allows us a little bit of rain, rain delay. Um, the um, turf provider has also provided a, a letter with recommendations for setups on fields on how to protect the field and the types of chairs and um, protection for stage setup. So um, we've done what we can, I feel uh, right now to plan for that event. I figured you had done that the great job that you do. Uh, just in general, uh, our fees, again, back to graduation, I don't know what we paid to to uh, RLDS, but did, 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 did we get, are we debt free on that or do we have to pay anything since we're not using that facility for three events? Yeah, I can answer that one, Dennis. We did not have to pay anything since they were not able to provide the venue to us on our scheduled date. So the agreement was just um, voided out. So I, I'm assuming again, the cost then for three simultaneous uh, graduations or four really, I guess. Um, we have fun, the funds, the, the, the setups, the, the, the chairs and all that kind of stuff is Again, just out of curiosity, that, that, that who's who's paying for that? Uh, and I can answer a little bit of that, Dennis. You know, we do, we have the funds allocated to the buildings for graduation expenses for this year that were not used, so we have those available to it. We are still in the process of evaluating what the costs will be to pull off the stadium graduations. There are a, a different um, variety from stages and renting, you know, things to go up to the technical aspect of, you know, video screens so that people can see what's going on in a large venue. You know, if we set this up outside, we want it to be a professionally done program, um, you know, like we do when we have them indoors. So we are still evaluating. Um, people who can provide those services options for us and don't have a number yet. Um, but, you know, we do have the funding um, that was allocated for rentals, et cetera, to use towards that. Okay. I, I knew you guys had it covered. I was just, again, out of, out of curiosity. And Kyle, Pleasant Lee Elementary was opened in 1995 or, I mean, 1965. That was the date on the construction drawings anyway, so. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's no big deal. I don't know anybody a question. I, I just, I know Pleasantly, Pleasantly Junior High was like 1970 or 71, but I, I, I when I saw it, again, it's, it's, it's in yeah. but I, I thought 1965, that, that seems, seems yeah, I believe it. I believe it was built just a few years before the middle school was there. Okay, all right, all right. Dennis, Ryan, any other questions you might have this morning? No, I don't. Thank I you don't. all for everything you're doing. Nope, I'm good. Thank you guys very much. Thank you both for being here this morning. And um, Dennis, we're going to miss having you on this team. Oh, I bet. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I'm going to miss you guys. You guys do a great job and so proud of everything and how thorough you are in, on each and every department. So uh, this is still truly a destination destination district. I feel the same. Thank you, everybody. We'll, we'll see you tomorrow night. All right. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.